Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble and I am here with Jenny Flora Wells and we're going to be talking about mental health. Now you may have heard me say on the podcast, you know, because we're, this is the profitable musician. We're talking about how to be profitable as a musician, but you cannot be profitable if you do not have your health. Health is wealth and that is both physical health and mental health. You cannot operate as an artist if you're struggling in either one of these areas. You cannot be at your peak performance. So that's why I thought it was really important that we talked about this subject today. So Jenny Flora Wells, she has a background in social work and also uh, working with artists, doing therapy, trauma therapy, all that kind of stuff. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, But first, Jenny, you want to give them just a background on yourself, like, you know, as an artist, and then as far as the area that you've chosen to go into and why. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me today, Brie. I'm very excited to be here. Um, So yeah, like Brie said, I'm Jenny Flora Wells. I am a licensed social worker in Ohio, and then an associate clinical social worker um, in California. I am working on launching my own private practice here soon in California, um, really focusing on trauma, artists, creatives, actors, and musicians. I've absolutely loved working with this um, type of uh, population, especially musicians, um, due to my own background and kind of where I come from. So I am an adoptee. And with that, and with my own lived experience, I have found so much deep healing from vocal performance and music. Um, My birth mother was actually really big into music. You know, I think she was a band groupie for Mm. quite, quite a few years. And so I think there's something there in our blood that kind of um, translated to me as an individual. So music has always resonated with me. It's always been a very healing experience um, in kind of hearing other people's lived experience and background through music and being able to express myself, you know, through that type of creativity specifically. Um, So yeah, vocal performance was very healing for me up until college. Um, I almost pursued it, but I, I chose not to. I kind of wanted it to be something that for me personally, I could do as kind of like my, my soul searching and my healing. And so I did choose to go in a different direction. Um, But it's very interesting to see how our, our passions and our paths uh, reemerge and and cross again. So it's been really lovely to specialize um, and work with artists and musicians specifically. So yeah, I hope that answered your question. (laughs) It does. And I think it's great to have somebody that can do therapy with artists that understand the artist mentality, the artist temperament, you know, because we are a little bit different. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm looking at your bio and I'm just, just to like demystify all these um, acronyms, like I would love for you, can you just let them know, like, what is an MSW, LSW, ACSW, yes. did they ever come into contact with those? <laughs> yes, for sure. And I know all the letters with um, mental health clinicians and therapists can be really confusing. A lot of them actually equate to the same thing. They're just like a different degree or discipline. Um, so MSW specifically is a master of social work is it typically is one to two years um, in school to get your master's um, in social work. And then LSW specifically is the kind of of level one, I guess you could say license in Ohio for social workers to be licensed. Um, and again, for each state, that's going to look a little bit different. So for other states, it might look like LMSW. I, I've seen, I don't know, other ones are CSW too. I don't know. It's confusing, but yes, licensed social worker. And then LCSW is the clinical license for social work. So it stands for licensed clinical social worker. And basically 
LCSW or LISW in other states, it basically means that the individual can practice independently. So that's what I'm working towards right now. Um, and then the ACSW, um, the one that is in my name currently, is basically that kind of um, baby step to <laughs> LCSW. So your, your associate clinical social work license takes basically 3,000 hours. Um, for me, it took two years. And yeah, I'll be able to test soon for my LCSW. And that's when that will change, if that makes sense. So yeah, got it. And you also call yourself a holistic therapist. What what does that entail? Yes, great question. So I specifically phrase it as holistic therapist, just to kind of explain to people what my approach is like as a therapist and the therapy that I provide. So basically, the word holistic kind of pointing at seeing the individual as a whole person. So in my practice, I'm really passionate about, especially working with artists, this is especially important, kind of understanding the fact that the individual coming into the therapy session is not just somebody who's just dealing with this certain isolated mental health issue. Even though that is a large part of the picture, right? This individual is also a mosaic of history, ancestral background, intergenerational trauma. Um, This person is affected by um, financial insecurity, possibly, or, you know, how does food insecurity come into the picture? What about the relationships, their connections with others? How do they express themselves, right? All of these things come to shape um, the individual in their life. And so it's really important to me, especially with where I've come from and my own lived experience to really approach, you know, therapy in that holistic lens. So seeing the individual as more than just a diagnosis. And I carry this into the approaches that I offer in my practice, which basically kind of approach trauma therapy and, you know, what the individual is wanting to work on from like a body-based root cause level. Um, So the specific approaches that I absolutely love to offer and kind of interweave and um, offer an eclectic lens, uh, you know, for each individual client are EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy. I love to use somatic therapy, which is body-based techniques. This can be really great for artists and creatives too. And then I really love internal family systems. Um, Sometimes this is called IFS or parts work as well. And then of course, with that, you know, I, I interweave other things that could be beneficial for, you know, the individual client, whether that be more psychoeducation, visual learning, meditation, more activities outside of sessions, right? What does that look like? What does community look like for the individual? So yeah, that's kind of summed up in a little summary, you know, of what I offer in my practice and, and the value that I find in a holistic approach. That's very cool. So I have a client who recently did EMDR and that was completely new to me. I'd never heard of it. And she was explaining yeah. to me how it works and she said it, it really helped her. And she went into it as a total skeptic too. Yeah. You know, um, and she said it really helped her deal with some traumas. Maybe you could explain that a little bit since that is kind of like the newest thing that's coming. I've seen it a lot ever since she told me that I've been seeing it around a lot. So maybe explain yeah. that to other other artists listening. Yeah, I'd love to. And I know even coming from somebody who was a client before I became a therapist, all of these little letters and acronyms are, they're confusing. So EMDR, like I had said, is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy. So that's what it stands for. Um, and basically it is is utilizing bilateral movements where we are engaging with the right and the left hemispheres of the brain in order to reprocess trauma or distressing memories. Um, and specifically why this works, because I know a lot of individuals, right, are like, what, this this sounds too good to be true, or this sounds silly, or I feel silly doing it, which is totally valid. What we are doing is we are basically kind of recreating what happens when we are moving through REM sleep in our sleep cycle at nighttime. So REM sleep is rapid eye movement, of our eyes moving back and forth, kind of you know processing our experiences from the day, Um, focusing in on rest and digest, right? Like preparing the body, all of that. And so we are utilizing that bilateral movement of moving back and forth to really reprocess the, you know, individual uh, target or distressing event that we're kind of zooming in on. Another thing I like to touch on with EMDR that a lot of people ask about is they say, okay, well, it's, 
it's eye movement desensitization. So does that mean that we're just doing your eyes moving back and forth? So originally the clinician who developed EMDR, she thought it was just eye movement. And as the research continued to expand, they actually realized that it was actually the movement of moving back and forth on the right and left hemispheres of the brain or the body. That is really what is processing the specific you know, trauma that you're trying to work through. So that's really great, you know, for people who might resonate with something different. I utilize tapping in my practice, Mm -hmm. tapping back and forth. Um, My musicians actually really love auditory cues going from left to right in their ears and like headphones. Um, I have some people who do a combination, right? You know, people, especially who are really into rhythm and patterns, right? They might like the tapping and the music, you know, they might like the eye movement. They, there's also been some studies recently about, um, Um, interweaving like dance movement therapy with EMDR. What does it look like to dance um, in a certain way or pattern of where we're initiating with the right and the left hemispheres of the brain and the body? So it's very interesting and it's quite the process too. It's like eight phases and you move through them and it's, it does a beautiful job of helping to build up the client with um, nervous system regulation techniques and, you know, different coping skills that can be really helpful before moving into that reprocessing phase. And yeah, I've seen a lot of a lot of great benefit in my practice with utilizing EMDR. Interesting. I've got a, an odd question for you. Do you yeah. have to be able to do you have to have good vision in both of your eyes to be able to do it? Because I actually have no vision in one eye and yeah. low vision in the other eye. And I made me wonder if you could even do the therapy without vision. Yeah. And so that's why I mentioned how Francine Shapiro, the, the clinician who developed EMDR, she realized that it wasn't just eye movement. So I have some people as well as myself who I've done EMDR many, many times. Um, I don't like the eye movement. Um, I actually find it too stimulating. Um, and I know other people can find it that way too. And so it, it can be totally possible for, um, you know, somebody who is like visually impaired or might not uh, prefer the eye movements to utilize the tapping, utilize the auditory cues. So you can keep your eyes closed Mm. during, you know, the entire reprocessing phase, if that's what resonates for you, which is really great. Interesting. That's cool. That's good to know. Yeah. So I'm curious, like, do you find that working with artists is somehow different from working with the general public? Do you Mm. feel like, um, you know, artists maybe have put mental health on the back burner or, you know, just, I kind of feel like there's this mentality of like, oh, you know, the tortured artist or, you know, the, the tortured poet or whatever. And it's like, part of being an artist and we feel like if we are to get healthy mentally that like we would lose some of our creative edge yeah absolutely and I I totally hear that and I think that's definitely topics that I've seen come up in the research that I've done around artists and mental health and mind you the research of the intersection between artists musicians actors and mental health is very slim as I'm sure uh, other people might know who are listening um, which is one of the reasons why I love specializing um, with this population because it's just not talked about, right? So I think that obviously with being any type of artist, right, we are offering another level of vulnerability that people in traditional career roles typically are not doing, if that makes sense, right? We, we, we are reaching in a beautiful way, right? In a lot of ways, right? Offering a certain level of vulnerability to, you know, the people who are listening to our music or who are consuming, you know, the art that we create, you know, in order to speak to them and to share our story. And I think that's, you know, the beautiful part of it. And <laughs> what comes with that is, you know, a lot of hurt. And I think in a lot of settings too, that we're seeing coming to the surface in the media is a lot of um, abusive work situations being taken advantage of um, due to like this kind of connection to with vulnerability and passion, right? Mm -hmm. You know, individuals who pursue art in, in, any, you know, in any part of the industry, right? I think for a lot of people, it's it's from our passion for it, right? And so with that, I think what we 
kind of need to zone in on is, um, which is really big in my practice too, is what do healthy boundaries look like with ourselves, you know, with these environments that we are working in, right? Because I don't think, and what I have seen that a lot of artists have heard, you know, from other therapists or, you know, coaches that they have worked with is they're like, oh, you need to leave the industry. (laughs) But for a lot of, you know, people, people love what they're doing, right? It's just this, you know, I get it. It's, you know, certain situations, right, that become too much become kind of pushing on those boundaries, difficult situations. And so it's like, how can we meet ourselves in the middle and find that balance right between that beautiful vulnerability that we're giving with the art that we're creating, while also having those healthy boundaries with ourselves and and utilizing the things that, you know, I bring into my practice that I think are so important that help individuals find, you know, that nervous system regulation, so we can integrate that, you know, if we are kind of sensing those feelings of burnout, sensing those feelings of anxiety or stress or exhaustion, right? So for me, it's like, how can we meet the individual where they're at um, and helping them with their own unique journey of being an artist and becoming an artist, you know, of finding that balance between the beauty and the vulnerability while also being mindful of when it becomes too much. So I don't know if I answered your question specifically, but I did want to cover that. Yeah, so. no, absolutely. And I, it's true. Like not many other professions, are you really putting yourself out there, making yourself that vulnerable and it can open up things that you might not realize it's, it's doing yeah. when you do that. How are there any like warning signs or how can people tell if they're having a struggle with their mental health if maybe they they don't know what to look for or they've just they've just always kind of been that kind of a temperament and maybe it's just piling up or something I mean I just I I see so many artists you know you hear in the news oh my gosh this person you know just committed suicide like is there any warning signs did they know that they were coming up against yeah and that's that's such a great question Brie and I um thing that is so difficult about it, right? Is it's so complex and individual, you know, to the unique person that we're talking about. And I think that for individuals that are listening, you know, today of like, what signs can I look for within myself, right? Because you are your own best expert, right? You know yourself the best, you know, that the, these changes that are shifting within you mentally, and even physically, right, can can be a message from our body, right, to listen to. So I definitely think that, especially with burnout, when we're talking about artists and you know, these incredibly overbearing work schedules and work conditions and constantly the need to like show up, show up, show up, you know, because we want to be successful. We want to get our art out there. We need to be really mindful of what I like to bring to uh, people's attention is the different survival states of the nervous system. So I know this has been kind of coming up in the media more, which I think is really great, but it is, um, you know, fight, fight, flight, or freeze, right? Um, And I think these are great kind of uh, internal uh, predictors that we can kind of isolate within ourselves when they're coming up for us. So specifically, like if we're feeling a certain level of like exhaustion, feeling frozen, feeling really depressed, right? That's that like freeze state, like our nervous system is like, like, I I feel so immobilized, right. Um, And this is where, you know, a lot of people do express those feelings of like, I just feel so depressed, I can't function the way that I used to, like, I feel so you know, exhausted, I feel like there's, you know, no reason for me to show up today, you know, these are kind of the uh, signs and symptoms, right, of this like freeze response that's going on in the nervous system. Um, And then moving up from there, because it's actually an evolutionary type of like ladder um, that we look at with these survival states, there's the, you know, fight, fight or flight response, right, of um, feeling really uh, hypervigilant, and activated, feeling like, oh, I'm so anxious. Like, I just feel like I need to, um, you know, continue to keep doing this and trying to find a solution and trying to figure it out. And, you know, it's either like that, or I I just feel like I need to run away from it. Right. And this is where we can see um, in therapy, I kind of call these the, the firefighters. This is an internal family systems, but this is where we have these you know, those things kind of coming out like um, addictive tendencies. Um, And I know that we see that a lot in the music industry is substance use issues, right, as a way to numb our, you know, emotions that are coming up and the stress that we are experiencing, because it kind of takes that edge off for us. Um, And of course, with these, uh, you know, firefighter or addictive type of impulsive 
uh, you know, damn, I can't think of the word I was thinking, um, kind of intuitions that come out within us. That this can go beyond substance use, right? This can be like overconsumption. This can be, um, you know, possibly like an addiction to shopping or an addiction to our phones, right? I know social media is really huge as well. So yeah, and then the other kind of state of the nervous system is it's called ventral vagal. Um, and it's feeling really socially connected and relaxed and you know, the ability to kind of get in touch with those flow states that we see in the beautiful parts of music, right, is, you know, when we do feel really connected to ourselves and the art that we're creating and just kind of feeling like that creativity is like overflowing. It's this beautiful experience. So um, I like to bring that idea of these survival states and, you know, ventral vagal feeling really socially connected and like connected to the self to people's attention um, because it is so individual for people and what we notice within ourselves when we're struggling with mental health issues and possibly the signs of burnout and stress um, and where we can kind of go from there. Mm. And so, I mean, there's fight, flight or freeze and freeze does sound kind of like depression, but is there some lower version of that that's like, I'm bored and uninspired? Like, is that a sign mm. of a mental health issue or do we just go through those like cycles as creative? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I think that with, with boredom, with, um, you know, kind of feeling like to kind of like that writer's block or that creativity block that I think a lot of people experience, I like to approach that as like, okay, this is a message from the body and the brain that we're receiving. Let's look into that a little bit more. And so this is where my kind of eclectic <laughs> modalities come into play with therapy. Um, and what I just mentioned with internal family systems, I think is really important. Um, so internal family systems specifically is bringing our awareness to the complexities of the mind in these different parts of us that come out during different times in our life. So for example, like you brought up boredom or writer's block, right? Um, we would kind of zoom in on that and be like, okay, this is something that's coming up for you. Maybe you're experiencing some frustration with that, some irritation that this is present for you. Let's zoom in a little bit and kind of focus in on what this part would even look like, you know, as you're experiencing it. So as we start to personify this part um, a great example of this is the movie Inside Out, right? We're kind of personifying this part into like a little character or something that's separate from us. So we can actually kind of pinpoint in different ways, like where could this be coming from? How is this tied to childhood, right? In a very simple way, we go much more in depth. And when does this come up for you? Does it come up during the day, you know, um, maybe in a certain time during the day where, you know, you're feeling a certain type of resistance or a more heavy amount of stress, or, you know, we're able to kind of pinpoint more, you know, where that could be coming from for the individual and what kind of meaning that brings out as well. So yeah, I think in a, in a simplistic way, though, I would encourage people to ask themselves, you know, kind of the, the, the questions that we do as we're journaling, right? Like, so this, this boredom is coming up. What, what does this look like for me? What emotions is this bringing up? Where is this coming up in my body? What would this look like if it were transformed into a visual, right? Seeing it as a visual. And we start to bring out more of those messages from the body and the brain that it's trying to send us, right? With these um, mental health symptoms that are coming up for us. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, certainly that could advance into apathy and depression. And, you know, so if you can kind of nip that in the bud early on. Yeah. And, and for me too, in my practice, it's, it's helping people understand too, that like the more that we can become that curious observer of the brain and the body and these things that are coming up for us, um, the less we feel the intuition to push away these, you know, mental health symptoms that we're experiencing, because we're seeing them more as a message, and as something to work with and to have compassion for rather than something to push away. Um, and that's where the true healing happens that I see in my practice, too, is when we can really mindfully and in a very, you know, purposeful and, and safe environment, you know, kind of sit with that a little bit. Mm -hmm. And what does that look like to get to know these different parts of us? And for my artists, they really resonate with, you know, IFS and uh, somatic work and EMDR, because there's a lot of artistic expression within that, too, and being able to artistically kind of express in relation to their mental health can be really empowering. 
So yeah. Which makes total sense because a lot of artists write music for their mental health. You know, they they need to get this stuff out and they can't say it to someone, but they can write it in a song. Yep. Yep. And then it resonates with other people and it's like a ripple effect, right? It becomes yep. more of, you know, kind of transforming the emotions and the lived experience of being human. So yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Makes sense. So we've talked a lot about, you know, the kinds of therapy that you do and the kinds of therapy that you can help artists with. When someone comes to you as an artist, how do you figure out what might be the first or next thing to try for that particular person? Yeah, that's a really great question. So for me, I am very person-centered and that's a specific approach that some therapists um offer in their practice. And basically what that means is it's seeing the client as the expert, right? Which is very important, right? It's very important to me that with anything that I implement in therapy, that it's a collaborative process. So it always starts as a conversation in like, you know, in the first session, right? Like what, what are we trying to work on? But also like what resonates for you? You know, what's your learning style? What, um, you know, what does this look like for you? And the way that I look at it too is in treatment planning with therapy, like our little roadmap to, to healing, right? I always tell people that it is a living document and being human, things evolve and change in the most beautiful ways, right? Over time. Um, and, you know, our, our treatment plan, our roadmap can always change too. And so I always give people the opportunity to voice what is feeling good in therapy, what they might want to tweak, you know, uh, what they want to say yes or no to, right? Because sometimes we do something in therapy that we're like, whoa, 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 whoa this is pushing past my window of tolerance, or um, I'm just not feeling this today, right? Sometimes we have days when we've dealt with a lot of stuff in our daily life and just kind of want to talk about it, right? Instead of doing EMDR, IFS. Um, so I really just kind of look to the individual client and kind of have it be a very collaborative process. And, you know, even if I, you know, think something would be beneficial at the end of the day, it's empowering the client to, um, you know, help them make that choice of what feels best. Which is interesting. Or, yeah. If you, if you think about physical therapy, right. I, I've never had physical therapy, but everyone I've talked to that have had it, they're pushing you like they are pushing yeah. you way beyond what you think you can do. And you are sore. Yeah. Like, how does that, translate in mental health because you you're saying you don't want to push someone to do something they don't feel comfortable with but do you feel like you do need to try to encourage them to do that in order to expand sometimes oh absolutely and we do implement that in therapy um in a lot of ways and like in encouraging people you know you know kind of expressing like you know this would be really beneficial if you would be open to it mm -hmm. and when we are working with survivors of trauma, it's really important to not be forcing the individual to do something, even if we think it would be beneficial, because therapy needs to be a place where it, it at least in my mind, it is a very collaborative process. And there is a, well, there are moments where we are encouraging the individual and I guess pushing um, in a very <laughs> um, compassionate way. The, yeah, from the perspective yeah. of someone who is licensed and trained and knows what could help. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. And um, it's, yeah, I, I think with people who have experienced trauma and especially artists too, who tend to be, you know, um, affected by different types of trauma. I have just always found it very beneficial to kind of have a collaborative space and, and even talking with the client too. This is a conversation that I like to have with people too, of like, what do you prefer in therapy? You know, there are some people who don't necessarily want to be pushed, but they want to have, you know, um, kind of share space together you know? So I think it kind of depends on what the individual's goals are and then continuously kind of checking in to see what's feeling good, you know, what we need to work on and what that looks like. So. Yeah, that makes sense. And then on the side of, you know, as we would call it preventive maintenance, right? Like we don't want to wait until we're in mental health crisis to get help. Just like we don't want to wait until we have diabetes to cut out the sugar or, you know, wait till we're at 300 pounds to go to the gym. Like, how do we know when we should go? Like, should, do you believe everybody should be in some kind of therapy or? 
That's a great question. I love these questions you're asking, Bree. These are, I, I, well, I think these are questions that a lot of people are, are asking themselves and what this looks like. So while I do think everybody could benefit from therapy, I am also aware that therapy can be very inaccessible to the general public, um, especially for some of our artists that are dealing with, you know, financial insecurity and, you know, having a really busy schedule too. Sometimes that doesn't match up with individuals that we feel resonate for us or, you know, there's a lot of different variables. So with what we've already talked about with like kind of checking in with the mind and the body and, you know, these signs that are coming up for us, maybe these shifts in how we are usually feeling um, as kind of signs that, you know, possibly we're dealing with something that could be a little bit more than just daily stress. Um, We're talking about, you know, accessibility and also things that people can do um, before kind of diving into therapy. Um, I really, really, really see so much benefit in kind of gentle practices on a daily or weekly basis based on what is best for the client's routine. So these practices that I've found to be the most beneficial are journaling, meditation, and yoga. And I know, I know these are the things that I feel like so many uh, clinicians talk about. And I think there are ways that um, I think what people don't talk about is the, the fact that we can start as small as five minutes a day And it is incredibly effective, incredibly effective. Our subconscious mind does not know what is real or what's fake at the end of the day. So if we are doing some sort of gentle movement where, you know, we're able to kind of get in touch with the body or we're doing a guided visualization on an app like Insight Timer that I really love. It's a free um, meditation app with like thousands of different choices. Oh, yes. I have a musician client who was on Insight Timer and she was doing live streams and stuff like that and had a community and everything in there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. And it's, it's a, it's a free resource that I love uh, to utilize and recommend to people. But I just really love to encourage people that like when people talk about meditation and yoga and all of these things that we know are beneficial, I want you to know that it's not something that we have to do for hours a day in order to see benefit from. And I think that's where people, that's where we get the eye rolls, which I totally understand. And it's so valid because it's like, well, how am I supposed to sit in silence when my life is, you know, filled with all of these things that I need to do. And I need to, you know, um, work on my, my songs and I need to, you know, work with this agent and, you know, do this and do that. And I have so many things on my checklist, right? Truly, 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 truly. It is these baby steps, these short blurbs of practice that are just effective, just as effective as hours of practice. It is these short blurbs that are getting our nervous system and our brain acclimated to these type of practices over time. So we, our system basically can understand, oh, this is a moment for me to focus on relaxation, centering into the body, centering into these things that are coming up for me so I can gain that deeper understanding. So I really do recommend those practices to anybody who's wanting to kind of start a journey or even just like kind of check in with themselves of of what their mental health looks like for them individually and ways to kind of make that accessible. I love Insight Timer. There's a lot of great trauma-informed yoga teachers on YouTube, like really great cl- like classes and sessions on there that I utilize myself if I can't get to a studio. And then with journaling, you know, what does it look like to even just allow yourself to like brain dump into like the notes app on your phone or on a sheet of paper. It can be so, so amazing. Um, And then the kind of second resource that I wanted to mention that um, I've heard from quite a few people has been beneficial. I haven't gotten the chance to do it myself yet, but it's the book called The Artist's Way. Oh, yes. I've read that. That's a great book. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, if somebody is wanting to kind of start that journey, right? Of that intersection between music and being an artist and mental health and kind of the creative flow and like all of these things go together, right? I think that's a really beautiful way um, that somebody can find some of that accessibility on their own time to kind of dive into that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And in a short way, I think everybody can benefit from therapy. And I understand that, you know, that's not always the case for everybody. And so how can we bring about accessibility? Um, 
you know, in different ways for healing. So, yeah. So I've had people say to me, I don't think therapy can work for me because I'm just too messed up or because yeah. I don't really believe it works or yeah. any of that. Like, is there any way to, is there any way to get past that with people or do they really have to believe that it works for them for it to work? That's another, that's another heavy hitter question. I, uh, I think that it's really difficult, right? Um, and I'm specifically speaking to the people that have had past experiences with therapy right, that have been um, invalidating or maybe have been just ineffective. And people have spent a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of vulnerability, right, in sharing with the therapist, you know, what they're wanting to work on and trying really hard to heal. And I think that's the really difficult piece of therapy that even as a clinician, like I, I, I just really think we like as an industry need to do a much better job in kind of explaining approaches to clients um, because it truly is about what resonates for the individual. And I think for a lot of people, they have these experiences with traditional therapy, which is typically talk therapy of therapists saying, well, how does that make you feel? Mm -hmm. And how can you think differently and think more positive? And the reality of that is, is, if we're thinking holistically and as we are like, like humans are mosaics. We are like, we are musical compositions, right? We are complex, mm -hmm. these beautiful, beautiful beings um, that consist of so many different things. And so with that in mind, <laughs> telling somebody to just think differently, it, let's be real. It doesn't work. And even for people who um, might find benefit from it for, you know, a temporary period of time, these are people that we still, you know, hear from everywhere who will say, yeah, I think, you know, it was beneficial in the moment to have that support and that therapeutic relationship. But at the end of the day, I'm still dealing with the trauma that I was dealing with 10 years ago. And so that's where, you know, rightfully so we hear from a, a lot of individuals who will say, well, therapy didn't work for me. And what I, what I, uh, am really passionate about expressing to people is it's not that therapy wasn't working for you. It's that you didn't have an approach that really um, kind of validated the fact that you are this whole being. <laughs> and there's more to you than just talking about our issues, right? Um, and so that's where I think a lot of these body based techniques and, you know, creative approaches and therapy are kind of coming into play. And I think it's also about to finding a therapist that resonates for you. And that's the difficult thing too, is a lot of individuals have had experiences with people who were not inclusive, maybe people who were, you know, just kind of fostered a very like unwelcoming environment. <laughs> and um, so that's where I think people can carry away some of those beliefs with therapy. With that in mind, it's all about self-determination. Um, and so at the end of the day, we can't obviously make somebody do something. Um, so that's where I think that, uh, you know, kind of allowing the individual to and encouraging other people to start their own kind of self-discovery journey on their own first and seeing how that feels within themselves. And then when they feel ready, knowing that, you know, they can start therapy when that feels good for them. So yeah, it really is such a complex thing. And I wish that I could speak to everybody um, who's wanting to have a, you know, uh, a really welcoming and inclusive and safe space to have therapy in and, you know, encouraging them that there are people out there like me who <laughs> are really passionate about holistic therapy and, you know, seeing you as more than just a diagnosis or a patient, right? Because mm -hmm. you are. You're a beautiful human. So yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So I know you have a TikTok account. Are you creating um, mental health content on there? Yes. And I'm still very new, <laughs> but I am um, adding more and more. I post TikToks every day and starting to bridge out to and more, uh, actual content for like musicians and artists, because I think that's really important. And people also too can check out my website. I, uh, I have a resources page that I'm continuing to add to um, that has like different hotlines on it that people would find beneficial, um, different apps, free apps, you know, things that are accessible for individuals, especially during this time. 
And then I also have a section of that resource page too, which is all about job search stuff. Cause I know that's especially, um, you know, just a big issue right now for individuals with that intersection of mental health too. Um, so yeah, people are welcome to utilize that and welcome to join me, um, on my TikTok too. Okay. So what are those addresses and handles? Yes. Um, everything is Jenny Flora Wells and I will give Bree the URLs and handles to put, um, in the bio too. We'll have it in the show notes, but (laughs) JennyFloraWells.com and at Jenny Flora Wells on TikTok. Yes. Correct. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Is there anything else you wanted to say to uh, artists that are listening today about the intersection of being an artist with mental health? Yeah, I, a quote that like really resonates for me. And I just, I I always like to share with people is that like, it's all about, um, you know, coming home to ourselves. And I think that this is something that's so true for artists at the core is that, you know, through our music, through the art that we're creating, it's all about coming home. It's all about, you know, getting in touch with ourselves. And I want everybody to know who's listening that it's possible to also start your healing journey and kind of intermix that with the beauty of art and music and knowing too that there's there's uh, clinicians out there that more and more that are specializing in musicians specifically. Um, and the last thing that I just thought of that uh, people anywhere that are listening could really benefit from is... Um, There's actually a website called Backline Care um, that specializes in mental health care and like finding therapists for people in the music industry. I know Mm -hmm. that I'm a I'm a back back backline care clinician um, and they just do a really, really great job of that intersection. Um, And it's the first place that I've seen that um, actually has like case managers on their team that can help people find a therapist um, that specializes in the industry specifically. So. So yeah, that could be a good place to start. (laughs) Yes, that's a great resource. Thanks for that. Yeah. Thank you so much for everything you shared today. It was really, really um, helpful, enlightening, especially for me in certain areas of therapy that I didn't know about. So thank you so much. I know that our listeners have learned a ton today. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Bree. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician. 